history turns into historical fiction and then turns back into history. I, I had an email a few days ago um, from somebody that I've never met, uh, but he says, um, I was at Alice Roosevelt's 90th birthday party in February 1974. Sorry I didn't see you or President Nixon there. <laughs> uh, in any case, when it was my turn to speak with her, such beautiful blue eyes, I told her there was a play at the Kennedy Center going on called Bully, um, and that it was about her father. She said it sounded boring. <laughs> she asked about the title, and I said, well, he was famous for saying bully whenever he was pleased with something. And she replied, nonsense. He never said any such thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to talk a little bit tonight about how I came to write the book, and then I'm going to read one short chapter uh, from it, a, a chapter that is the reader's first um, acquaintance in the book with Rosemary Woods, the president's fiercely loyal secretary. And, uh, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. It's, it, with Richard Nixon at the Senate, you never have to fear that there'll be no questions. If there, if there aren't any, you just sort of say, does anyone have an opinion about Richard Nixon? <laughs> and uh, it tends to start, I would find. Um, I think I was a long time uh, coming to write this. Um, uh, it really, a kind of lifetime uh, approach to it. Uh, I grew up in a very Republican household, and uh, we were, um, we meaning pretty much everybody in my town, even though we were Irish Catholics just over the city line on Long Island, a very Nixon country. And um, my father, especially, um, I went to fourth grade in the fall of 1960 every day wearing a Nixon Lodge button. That said, experience counts. And I would argue with my nine-year-old classmates that John F. Kennedy didn't have enough experience to be president of the United States. It was a very <laughs> out there position for a nine-year-old to take. <laughs> but, uh, and my first real memory, my first real political memory, is election night 1960 when I uh, I was afraid to cry in front of my mother and my sister, so I remember going from the living room into the kitchen to talk to my father when things looked as if they were going badly for our man. And I asked him if um, Nixon was in fact going to lose, and he said it was looking that way. And um, I, it was sort of um, difficult uh, for me. Uh, I don't know what it was uh, about me, but I, I had, I think, some sort of identification uh, with him, which is kind of horrifying uh, to admit. I mean, there was a story, um, Roger Ailes, who runs the Fox Channel, uh, in his 20s, he was uh, on Nixon's 68 campaign. He was uh, a media consultant and was very frustrated with the experience. And he said, you know, working for this guy, you know, everybody else at 10 years old for Christmas got a football. He's the guy who got a briefcase and was happy. <laughs> and it was a very old story, it was sort of contemporary with that campaign. And I remember when I first heard it thinking, well, what's your point? <laughs> I was this sort of striving Alex P. Keaton uh, type. I was, there was also a part of me that was in love, I think, with defeat and reaction. I mean, I remember in school plays, I played, in school debates, I played King George III, I played Jefferson Davis. I don't know what that was really about, but it was probably prefiguring things in some ways. Um, and I was very attentive to Nixon's fortunes in what he called the wilderness leaders uh, by the time he got ready to come back in 1968. Um, I shook his hand during the 1968 campaign. He came through my town. He drove down Hempstead Turnpike uh, with Pat and with Rockefeller. Uh, who was governor then. I remember the kid behind me who was much younger yelling and uh, saying to his mother, is that the rich guy? Is that the rich guy? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't at all interested in Nixon. Um, but the car stop, it was an open car. I, I find this uh, almost unimaginable, but it's not a faux memory. Uh, even though this was six months after Martin Luther King's assassination and Robert Kennedy's assassination, he came down in this white Lincoln and he stood on the trunk and he gave this the speech that was full of tormented World Series metaphors. It was October. <laughs> and I, I got close and I shook his hand. And I shook Mrs. Nixon's hand, too. She was sitting on the back, uh, you know, she was sitting on the top of the back seat 
uh, of the open car, and she's very pretty. Um, she sort of looked like the actress Barbara Billingsley, you know, played <laughs> Leave It to Beaver's mother, and um, and she smiled at me, and I I remember that the image that stuck with me for many years was um, she she was wearing these spiky, spiky, spiky heels, and they were digging into the red leather upholstery of the back seat, and I mean I. I scarcely knew what pornography was at 16 or 17, but I, I mean, it's later, in later years, it struck me as this sort of odd image for Pat Nixon, you know, with these spiky heels digging into red leather. And it's sort of like, <laughs> and I think it suggested hidden depths that uh, may have led me to uh, uh, give her this little romance uh, in the book, uh, this romance she has during these wilderness years, the years that the Nixons lived in New York. And um, in any case, uh, Nixon was the president for the entire time I was in college. I was a freshman during Penn <clears throat> State in Cambodia. Uh, China said everything. The draft ended the week that I graduated. We were all secretly grateful to him, but too mortified to admit it. And, um, and then, of course, he just uh, loomed as this figure uh, in the endgame of Watergate and throughout his post presidency. Much better former president than he was a president. Um, and um, in any case, I, I, I began writing historical novels uh, you know, more than 20 years ago. And the pattern for them was sort of set by a book called Henry and Clara, which was about the couple who were in the balcony with the Lincolns on the night of the assassination. And I developed a certain fondness for telling historical uh, events, or recounting them in fiction through people who were on the periphery of them, not the main characters and so forth. And, um, and that uh, is true of this book to a large extent. And the people tend to be famous in this book. I mean, Mrs. Nixon, Rosemary Woods, but they're not the, the principal players. Although some of them, including Nixon himself, uh, it, he's a, what we call in the creative writing biz, he's a POV character, a point of view character. We do see things from his perspective and that uh, I had never done in the past. I mean, I never showed anything from Lincoln's uh, perspective in Henry and Clara. I tried it, and uh, every time I wrote dialogue for him, he sounded like Raymond Massey. <laughs> I this is awful, I can't do it. But, um, uh, but with Nixon, what was extraordinary is you had not only his public utterances, which of course everybody's heard, uh, but you, uh, his speech of mine, but you also had the tapes. And so you hear him in all of his unguarded, profane, angry moments, too, uh, in a way you don't hear any other politician. But um, just a few last words uh, for reading. Uh, after Henry and Clara came out, uh, uh, James Atlas, the uh, biographer and editor, uh, he took me to lunch, uh, and he asked me, he was editing what was called the Penguin Brief Live series, a series of short biographies, and he asked me if I would be interested in writing a short biography of Lincoln. And I, I said, no, thanks, but um, I just didn't see what I could add to, you know. I mean, in Washington now, across from Ford's Theater, there's a new education center, which now destroys the last possible illusion that when you're on 10th Street, it feels like 1865. But there's this big, glassy education center about Lincoln. And the main decoration is this tower that is, um, consists of thousands and thousands of books about Lincoln that have literally been glued together to form this giant cone, and I just couldn't see it adding to this. It wasn't there uh, then, but uh, still, there was just so much there. But I, I remember when we were leaving the restaurant, I was somewhere, somewhere here in Midtown, and I remember just saying spontaneously to him without thinking, I said, but you know, don't ever give away Nixon without at least calling me. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they, they ever even did Nixon in the series, but, um, and Dan Frank, my wonderful, loyal editor who um, I've worked with for nearly 20 years now, he, um, he was sort of nudging me toward a non-fiction book about Nixon, and um, never really happened. But I, I live in Washington, I moved to Washington in 2003, and I live across the street from the Watergate. It's what I see from my study every day, and it was just one of these things, uh, you know, there's so many stories of how novels get started. I was just on H Street one night, and then I, and I thought, you know, I think I'm going to write a novel about that um, more than nonfiction, and this is uh, what happened. But as I say, I think I'm 
I think it was building up to this for decades. And um, what I'm going to read is um, a fairly short chapter that takes place on June 23rd, 1972. That's six days after the burglars have been arrested. And um, <clears throat> this interested me uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, this was the day that Nixon unwittingly generated the smoking gun tape um, when he uh, told Haldeman, his chief of staff, uh, during the morning to tell the CIA, to tell the FBI, to ignore the break-in. Uh, tell them this is a comedy of errors. Without getting into it, the president believes this is going to open the whole Bay of Pigs thing again, because the burglars were Cubans who had been involved in the Bay of Pigs, um, thanks to Howard Hunt. Uh, tell them they, meaning Vernon Walters or Richard Helms, should call the, the FBI in and tell them don't go any further into this case, period. That was the smoking gun. That was the sentence that ensured uh, Richard Nixon's departure from office. So that was generated uh, in the Oval Office uh, on the morning of the 23rd. That afternoon, there was a taping going on. David L. Wolper, the documentary filmmaker, was um, making a campaign film to be shown at the convention a couple of months later. And uh, a real film, not a video. And um, they were having all of the White House staff come in and interact with Nixon, you know, to get these little shots uh, that they could then display uh, in the film. And um, so I was struck by how, while, while that was being filmed in the afternoon, as the cameras were reeling, inside the desk was this piece of tape that was going to uh, force him out of office, uh, you know, while they were filming this thing designed to help him get reelected to office. And I, so I, that was the scene that appealed to me. Um, and um, he, uh, it was the Wilson desk that he thought it belonged to Woodrow Wilson, who was his famous president, his favorite president, who was the president um, when Nixon was a very small boy. In, in fact, he found out and was quite annoyed uh, well into his presidency that the desk actually belonged to Henry Wilson. The Wilson <laughs> desk really belonged to Ulysses Grant's vice president. <laughs> but they kept it uh, in the old office anyway. So um, this, um, this, it was a Friday afternoon, the 23rd, and um, this scene shows Rosemary Woods in her office getting ready for her part um, in the film. And um, it's about 10 minutes to four. <laughs> 